Okay. So, okay, so we're going to go over the games, as I said. So, so we're going to start with the first game played between Levy Rosman and Griffin McConnell. Now, people who have been watching my stream for a while may or may not be familiar with Griffin McConnell. He is um, he's a junior chess player from the great state of Colorado. Um, now, he has had many brain surgeries over the past couple of years. Uh um, in terms of trying to like be capable of functioning normally, also being able to play chess, um, all these different things. I think we watched the documentary on him. He had like a seizure, and there were all co- all sorts of uh, other issues. Now, we, I do know that he had some. He had a procedure which I believe did work as well, um, not so long ago. So that's why he is able to play chess, um, play chess right now. And of course, it's a great story. I I don't have the link for that video right off, but we did we did watch the video, and it's it's pretty it's pretty inspiring. Okay. So Levy uh, plays c4, Griffin plays e5, knight f3, knight c6, d4. Okay. Um, first of all, this is not. Um, uh, it's a, this yeah, this is not this is not a high quality opening. Um, <laughs> uh, also, knight f3 here is already not the. Wait, so I'm really confused here. So what is knight f3 by Levy to begin with? Because the way you play this is you almost always play knight c3 or g3 here. You don't generally play knight f3. Knight f3 is a very unusual move. And then Levy plays d4. Um, also kind of surprising. I don't. I mean, maybe Levy's just trying to avoid um, trying to avoid preparation or something. But already this is a little bit dubious by him. Because even here you still can play knight c3, d3, and g3, which is classic um, – Classic, the classic English opening. D4 is not, it's not a high quality move. Um, so takes knight f6, trade, and now Levy plays g3 here. He's kind of gotten, I think, a little bit of what he's wanted though, which is that, um, which is that the point is that we're we're just kind of in a normal position. It's very, very sort of a slow and and open. Um, now I will say something else separately that I think that I think is kind of important. You guys say that Levy's trying to avoid preparation. If you're playing against an 1800 level player um, and you're 2300, for example, you really should not be afraid of their preparation at all. You should just play your best openings, play the best moves, and play to win. You should not be afraid of walking into some sort of um, some sort of preparation because an 1800 level player they're very they're very good, but they're not on the same level that you're at as a 23 or 2400 player. So. Um, so I don't really like the concept of trying to avoid um, trying to avoid theory because the fact is you're a better player. Just prove it. Um, so okay, so so knight c six b six g three. Okay, bishop b four knight d two queen e seven bishop g two. Okay, bishop a six. Now this is kind of going in the wrong. This is starting to go in the wrong direction with bishop a six because what we have here is we have something which is the um, we have what's something similar to kind of. Uh, uh, the Scotch Gambit, the Miesis variation, where black is this very interesting pawn structure, and you have Bishop on C8. Now, in the Miesis, for example, which I will show you guys very briefly, uh, you do actually play like that. For example, you're probably wondering what opening I'm talking about, but I'm talking about this line, um, where basically after knight d5, c4, you go Bishop a6. And as you'll notice, it's the same kind of structure with the pawns. And in many cases, um, for example, you'll have lines like something like this, where you'll go like queen e6. I'm just making moves. Of course, these are not the best moves. But you will get bishops like this with the with the structure of the pawns here in the box. Um, so kind of it's 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 understandable why Griffin plays this way because based on the structure of the pawns, it makes some sense to put the bishops on a6 and b4 based on another opening. But even though you have the same structure in this opening that we have here, um, it's kind of going the wrong direction because the, the thing that you really want to play for is you really want to play for either d5 or d6 and develop the bishop on, on the c8 square to either f5 or g4. It doesn't, um, it's not as effective on a6 because even if you get d5 in, you're, you're really going to struggle because white has a great bishop on g2 aiming towards the pawn on c6. Um, so castle's played, griffin takes. Ah, this is a bad move. Now, this is kind of, I, I don't blame Griffin for playing this. It makes a lot of sense, but this is actually a very bad move because White starts to get a big initiative here. And if people have looked at, um people have looked at uh, Alpha Zero type games, you'll understand that sometimes a pawn or two pawns, uh, it's worth sacrificing in order to get a lot of peace play uh, right away. So takes queen d2 here. Queen f4? What is queen f4? That's not in the spirit of the position at all. Like in this position, you should just go b3, bishop b2, e4, rook e1, f4, rook d1, and just crush in the middle of the board. Um, I do not like queen f4 at all. Actually, this shows this this kind of shows again 
the difference, uh, um, you know, sort of uh, of the understanding level. Because there's also another game that pops into my mind right now, which is that there's a game between um, there's a game between Wesley So and Fabiano Caruana that was played in the recent recent um, Grand Chess Tour event held in um, held in Romania and. Um, and in that in that game, there was a, something similar where Wesley ended up up a pawn, but but or not Wesley, sorry, Fabiano ended up a pawn, but Wesley was able to uh, was able to get a lot of play with the with the uh, the bishop pair. Um, so he goes queen f four, which I don't like here. Um, that being said, uh, that being said, bishop. I guess the computer says you can take the pawn and survive. You know, again, for a computer, very easy to see. For a human, a very tough move to play. Um, now, do I think a top-level 2700 player could find this move? In a, in a slow game, plenty of time on the clock, I think it's very likely they could. That being said, it's very easy to see ghosts, and I, I would not expect um, anyone below at least 2650 to play queen takes e2 here. It's a very tough move to play. Um, so... So bishop a6 is played, and now, now, um, now after queen c7, um, white is just much better because again, white is it's even material now again. But secondarily, white has the bishop pair, and he's going to again be able to play like rookie one b3, bishop b2, or even rookie one and e4. And white should be much better here. So castle is played, bishop g5, rook fc8, queen a5, queen e2 uh, takes rookie one, and now Levy correctly plays queen c3. That being said. As I go through this, I kind of wonder, was bishop g5 right? Like, I don't know. To me, rook e1 looks obvious. Oh, and I guess it's the best move, in fact. Um, but but I, it feels like somehow here, white is better, of course. But but in the meantime, it's turning into an end game where it's going to be even material and black is an open king, but there are less pieces on the board. So uh, queen a3 instead of queen c3. Aha, uh -huh. queen a3, but then queen b6. And what's the point? Okay, again, you can play like an alpha zero or stockfish. Go queen d6, positionally just crush the board here. Even bishop e4. I mean, yeah, this is this is pretty this is pretty uh, pretty dank. Um, honestly, like this is pretty dank. I wouldn't expect that. Um, yeah, queen a3 is is very dank. Very dank um, is what I would say. Uh, so queen c3, rook e8, trade. Queen c5, h4 is played. Um, rook e6. Trade okay, fe6 again. Uh, it's even material, but white is much better if not winning. Simply, white is white is winning here. Sorry, I heard a desk move in one of the other rooms, but um, white white is simply a uh, white is simply much better here because even though it's even material, black's king is very open, and white's going to control the open file. Additionally, the bishop on g2 has a target on potentially c6, also, it can go to e4 and target h7. The bishop on a6 is sort of it's it's on a diagonal, but it's not it's not scoping anything. There's nothing to be captured. So because of the light square bishops, white is much better combined with the bad king positions. So takes, um, uh, rook d1 played, rook f8, uh, queen d4 here, black trades and goes d5, rook g4, king f7, rook a4. Of course, the best move. Uh, bishop d3 takes, king f6. Okay, rook c7. Not sure if it's the best move, but it should be good enough. Yeah, because now when black takes on a2, you take on d5, and it's just a winning, winning rook and pawn endgame. So takes, takes, takes. And now it's pretty, pretty, pretty routine. Um, okay, not a whole lot, I think, needs to be said. White's up two pawns. Okay, rookie seven. And yeah, th this is, I mean, not, not, not much more needs to be said. White can just go like f4, g5, rook b7. So pretty clean game for, for white, um, or pretty clean game for Levy, I should say. Not, not, you know, not, not super difficult. Um, so pretty smooth. Again, opening was not great. I think, um, you real. I will say that against certain level players, um, uh, Certain level players, um, what was I saying? Like, you really should not be afraid of their preparation. You re you really just have to play your best move. And against someone who's like 18, 1900, it, you probably can get away with it. But I, but I, what I would say is that to a certain degree, you really do need to trust yourself. Because against the 2300 or 2400, when you play an opening that's slightly dubious, if you get a... Um, you, you play something that's subpar, they will equalize, and you're not going to get, you're not going to have chances to, um, you're not going to have winning chances. So you really do need to trust yourself quite a bit more. So that's what I would say. Um, he would play. He said he wanted to play something worse against a lower rated opponent. Um, well, that's just a bad mindset to have, frankly, um, because that that's like that's like worrying. That's like you're just worrying that your opponent's gonna have some special preparation. Like if you spent months studying for the tournament um, and you're well prepared, believe in yourself. Just believe in yourself. Play your best openings. 
Um, so, so that's what I would say. So, okay. So that's, um, that, that's the first game we're going to go over. Uh, let's go on to the next game. Next game is between Daniel Herman and Eric Rosen. So we're going to look at Eric Rosen's game, second game. Um, so E4, E5, knight F3, knight C6. Okay. D4. We have, um, Bishop B4. Okay. So Eric plays Bishop B4, trying to, trying to play something dubious, just like Hikaru Nakamura did in his game against Anish Giri in the FTX Crypto Cup. Um, uh, Eric's not a, uh, they have, er wait, why do they have Eric Rosen 1823? Maybe it's just glitched. Anyway, Eric's not 1823. Um, <laughs> he's not 1823. But anyway, um, okay. So C3, Bishop C5. Okay, takes. Bishop D3. Queen H4. Is this Eric's game? Um, okay, kind of some dubious play by Eric as well. Playing some some weird stuff here. Uh, this is obviously not great. Although it's kind of in the in the in the vein of playing like something um something like a Stafford gambit, kind of just getting the queen, the knight, knight, and the bishop out. But again, as you guys can see from the evaluation, this is quite a bit better for White here. So it's a little bit dubious. Um, so knight d2, knight e7. Okay, I think knight f6 has to be the more natural move here. But knight e7, knight f3, queen h5. Ooh, I don't like castles here. Um, okay, computer says something ridiculous like bishop a6, which no human in a million years is going to play. Um, but castles somehow, I just I worry about bishop g4 ideas and kind of just giving back the edge. So, so knight d4 kind of, this is the problem. Is here white's worried about bishop g4. He's worried about the bishop on c5 combined <clears throat> with the queen on h5 as well. So... Um, it's kind of like it's kind of hard to play here with white knight d4 now eric's able to trade and i'm sure at this point eric's like great i'm playing i assume eric's opponent is like an 1800 1900 and he gets an end game and so now the skill will really begin to show so a5 is played here uh bishop to e3 rook b8 good move b3 f5 actually i hate f5 what is f5 by eric that's a that's a not a move that I like. Not a move that I like at all. Um, I don't know. I mean, I feel like you should go bishop d7, rook e8, maybe some d5. But f5 really does not feel like he's in the spirit of position. Because after f5, um, he takes. Wait a second. Wait a second. Let me think about this for a second. Isn't there like bishop g5 here or something? Not sure, but this looks this looks kind of kind of sketchy. He takes now. Okay, so I guess now he takes. Computer says what? Bishop c four. Bishop. Oh. Wow. So you're supposed to throw in the in between move because the point is after takes. Um, bishop takes e four. You have rook f e one attacking the bishop on e four and the knight on e seven. Ah, very very tricky. Because in the game, when you take now, when you move the bishop back, I mean, it's even, it's like it's even material. But in, but if you play check first after here takes takes, you go rookie one, and Black's in really really bad shape here. Um, uh, because if you take the bishop, uh, it's even material, but you have a tower of power, and it, or it's a tower of weakness rather in this situation. And um, a five is also weak. There's rookie five coming, so this is really really bad. Uh, but anyway, Daniel Herman fails to play that. He takes here. Now the problem is if you go bishop c4 check, there's there's uh, there's bishop d5 um, as a move. So you, you can't really get the same thing because now I just block with bishop d5. So bishop e3 is played here. c5, rook d1, king h8, f3, bishop g6, rook e1, a4. Good move by Eric here. Um, the point is now you're willing to give up a pawn here. In return, you get a rook to b2. Eventually, you hope you can collect some pawns on the a file. So takes. Oh, actually, wait, no, I'm wrong. There's also bishop c2, which wins the pawn as well. Rook d2 takes, bishop c4, rook e8, rook b2, bishop c6. Mind you, the, 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 the funny thing is that um is that in this position, it's very hard to play because uh or not hard to play, but it's very hard to win. So I'm kind of curious how um how uh how Eric manages to win this game. By the way, those of you who are wondering, uh, Daniel Herman is actually um he he was a streamer from time to time. He was Camel Clutcher on Twitch. He was he was very active here. His sister, I think, still streams uh, Zefcat. So he's also someone from the from the streamer community as well. Okay, 
So knight d5, trade. Now king f2 is a big mistake here. What white should do here is white should actually probably just trade on d5 and say, how does black win this position? Um, something like c4 and bishop a4. Go after the pawns with the ice skaters on the back, and there should be a draw. So kind of a big mistake going king f2, because now after knight b6, um, I think black is significantly better. Rook a8, bishop d5, good move, target the pawn. Your structure is compact and solid here. So black is just quite a bit better. So rook e2, h6, bishop h4, g5. Now you trade. Uh, king e3, king g7, h4, trade. Okay. I still think white could probably draw this with uh, with correct play, by the way. Um, so bishop h2, bishop e6 here. Okay. Knight f4, bishop f1. Again, you don't trade here. So if you look at this position, look at all black's pieces. They're all in the blue tiles here. You have these pawns and the king on the blue tiles. And, and white's bishop is on the white tiles. And white's pawns also are on the white tiles. So this would be a losing end game here. Um, because white's bishop can't touch anything here. Whereas black's bishop can attack the pawns. And black has an extra pawn. So he can create a pass pawn in the center of the board. Um, so bishop f1 is a good move. Knight to g6 played here. King e3, knight e7. Okay, white waits. White waits. And now he blunders bishop c4. He gets he gets tricked here. Uh, what 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 white had to do here was go like bishop d3, bishop c4, and bishop to e4. So when black goes around the back with the bishop, um, tries to get him from behind. You have f4 here protecting the pawn um, on g2 with the bishop on e4. Because when you play f4 here, after bishop c4, you're forced to trade the bishops off, and you're down a pawn, and the knight on b6 is much better than the bishop on g3. So trade takes takes king d3 now knight to b6 played here um white goes king to e4 <laughs> black goes king out six you guys chill out seriously um bishop h4 king e6 g4 d5 king d3 knight d7 okay king e3 here kind of knight e5 ah because if you go king f4 here there's knight, e, knight g6 king g3 you trade and go d4 and now you just win the game here um if white tries to go back you can just take you have the tower of power but your pawn is pawn is close enough that it gets to the end of the board before the king gets over. Um, so so white goes bishop to d8, king d7, good move here. Knight g4, and now it's kind of is over for white. Um, I'll just go through the game pretty fast here. Knight b2, knight c4, and now you run the king up. Knight protects the pawn, run the king, move the knight, game over. Bishop b5, king c4, knight a4. And white resigns um, because if you move the bishop to like e5 here, black goes knight c3. If you don't take the knight and you wait, black just starts pushing the pawn all the way down the board. And if you trade after takes, takes, I go c4. And the lone pawn um, wins the game for black. If you go king e4, I go king to d2, king d4, c3, c2, c1, make a queen. And um, and if you go like king c5, I go here, here, c3, king b3, c2, king b2, king d2, protect the pawn, protect the queening square, and win the game. So um, good win, good win for Eric Rosen. Quite difficult, obviously. Um, probably was was not. Um, it probably was not easy uh, to hold. Although I mean, White could have, but Eric created chances. Game kept going, and he was able to outskill his opponent. All right, so let's keep going. Next up, we'll look at the game between uh, uh, Hans Neiman and Shevelev Oberoi. So game starts d4. Now this game, you guys, I actually did see this game on the broadcast last night. Um, so I, I do have I, I have already seen this game um, uh, before. So d4 knight f6 c4 is played. Uh, g6 knight c3 bishop g7. We get a king's Indian. Hans plays this bishop e2 bishop e3 setup. Uh, pretty classical. Uh, c5 d5 e6 knight f3 takes now b5. And I'm a little bit sketchy on the on the theory of this line. Um, I know e5 is the right move. Uh, this is all correct, but I think somewhere around here. Uh, after knight d7, this this should just be very good for white. But there are some blunders in the in the game. I guess I'm going too fast. So c5 d5 takes takes b5 is played by black here. The idea behind b5 is that if white takes with the knight, you take the pawn on e4. If white takes with the bishop here, you have knight e4, knight e4, queen to a5 check with a double attack um, of the king and the king and the bishop. If you block with the knight to protect, I excavate your knight and then I take the bishop. Um, and if you don't block, of course, you can play queen d2, queen b5, and knight d6. And white's up a pawn here. Um, I don't know which one's right. I guess queen a6 is apparently the right move. It gets very complicated because even though white's up a pawn, white cannot castle the king here as the queen on a6 uh, cuts off the f1 square. So um, 
So very complicated. So Hans plays e5. I assume this is all mainline theory. Uh, knight g4 is played here. Bishop g5, queen b6, white takes. c4 played, hoping to create a throbbing checkmate on f2. I guess actually white's king can run, so it's not, not quite there anyway. But it basically, first of all, it creates a threat on f2. It also prevents white from being able to capture. So like white's threatening to capture the pawn, so you prevent that. There's no capture, and you also create the second threat towards the pawn in f2. So white castles. Knight to d7, bishop e7 played by Hans. Again, supporting the extra pawn that he has uh, on d6 with the bishop on e7. Rook to e8 is played here. White goes a4. So, so Hans tries to chop the structure a little bit. Weaken the pawn on b5, weaken the pawn on c4 as well. Um, so knight, knight g to e5, Hans goes knight d4. And this is actually the big mistake in the game. Uh, and it's very peculiar that Hans played knight d4 here. Very, very strange move. I remember looking at this game. I was like, why didn't Hans just take with the pawn here? Because it seemed very obvious that after takes, takes, you're up two pawns. You should be much, much better here. Um, so I, I found it very peculiar that Hans plays this knight d4 move. Because to me, it just looked like after pawn takes pawn, it's um, it's just uh, it's just winning for white. So he goes knight d4. So b4 is played here. So now white goes knight c to b5. Um, and... and and Oberoi plays bishop b7, Hans goes bishop g5, and this is also another very, very weird move that I didn't understand, which was, why didn't Hans go knight c7 or pawn to a5 here, both of which looked good, um, because, like, when he moves to bishop, now it gets very, gets very messy, because a6, a5, queen c5, knight c7, and now black takes, and what you have is a situation where Hans wins an exchange, he wins one of these rooks, but there are big threats towards your king on g1 and the pawn on g2. So I was, I was very surprised when I saw this, um, that Hans didn't go knight c7 here. It seemed like a, one of the moves that should just be very, very strong for white. Um, but he goes bishop g5, a6, a5, queen c5, knight c7, queen d6. Now after knight e8, I suspect Hans missed the fact that after queen d5, black is threatening a checkmate on g2. So, so Hans plays knight f3, Oberoi takes with the rook. Hans plays bishop d2. Oberoi goes knight to c5. Um, and now it's very complicated because even though white has an extra rook, it's very passive on f1, and black's getting a jumper to d3 here. Uh, he's got the double op combo here, both bishops making the, the classic x formation. And he's also got a lot of pressure here in the center of the board as well. So it's very, very tricky in this position. So Hans takes. Oberoi plays knight, knight d3. Hans goes bishop c3. Again, solidifying this diagonal. Also trying to interpose the bishop on g7 so that this bishop has no scope towards the rook on a1. So knight to f4 is played here. Very, very good move by Oberoi. Again, putting the knight um, putting the knight on f4. You know, anytime you get a knife on f4, f5, it should be pretty strong when it can't be removed right away. Um, so rook e1 is played here. Hans, Hans plays rookie one, Oberoi goes queen c6, and it's very, very dicey, because again, you see there's a lot of pressure here uh, with the diagonal, with the rook on e8 aimed towards e1, very, very tricky position here, and e even though white's up material, you can tell that, it, you can tell that the, um, you can tell, uh, you can tell that based on the valuation, it's not that clear. So, bishop takes e5 is played here, Oberoi plays rookie five, Hans plays rook c1, Oberoi goes bishop f6, and this is kind of the big mistake here. Uh, it seems that in this position, Oberoi, I don't know if he was low on time or what was going on, but he was trying to get some, like, rook, g, rook g5 idea, I guess. He was worried about this uh, ice skater threat. But in this position, it's very, very messy. Um, Hans has not moved his queen yet. No, he hasn't. It's moved 28, and he has not moved his queen. Um, which, again, proves the classic maxim um, that... Uh, you can break the rules when you're above a certain rating. It's all about learning the rules and learning where the exceptions exist and where you can break them. Because Hans has not moved his queen, and we're on move 28. Um, so Bishop F6 is kind of a kind of a a bad move here. What Black should play is I think it's like Rook D5 or Rook G5. I mean there are a lot of options. Actually, Rook D5 makes sense because if you go Rook G5 first, I have the classic right triangle check and um, and I win the game. So you should probably go rook d5, and then I think rook g5 here maybe, and it's it's very, very tricky. It's very messy. Um, white might still be better here, but it's very, very complicated. Um, and I guess computer says after queen c4, white is better, but very, very tricky. Um, very, very tricky. So anyway, he goes bishop f6, and now after bishop takes c4, uh, all the all the threats kind of go up in flames because white's threatening the, uh, the fossil with bishop takes... Uh, Bishop takes f7 with a check, and then he wins the queen on c6 uh, with the rook on c1. So this is the first problem. Secondly, you don't really have time to go for knight g2 or knight h3 here, because if you just take, again, I can obviously fossilize you with bishop f7. Um, and if you, like, trade the rooks here, I can just take with the knight. Again, if knight h3, I very calmly ignore you with king f1. 
And if you take, you just don't have time because, again, there's the fossil. So for that reason, it all falls apart immediately. So Oberoi goes king g7. Hans plays rook e3. Again, I think this was a ridiculous move by Hans. Uh, he should have just traded the rooks here. I don't know why he didn't just do like something safe like this. Um, looks completely winning. Uh, so I was very I was very surprised by this move from Hans when I saw it. Um, makes a... Uh, Makes no sense to me. I, I mean, like you, you just trade, you go bishop f one, and voila, voila, and end of end of threats. Nothing's happening. You guard the knight, you guard your g two pawn, and now your rook your rook is great. So I, I was kind of appalled to see this um, <clears throat> that he played rook e three. So rookie four is played now again. I think here, yeah, computer says rook g five again is very very dangerous here with this weak pawn of g two because now if you go bishop f one. I go knight h3 check. You can't capture because of the pin. And on king h1, I take and I fork the king and the queen. So it's very, very dangerous. And rook e3 is, I mean, I don't know if Hans was low on time or what, um, but very, very, very fortunate to, um, to to get away with it because it was a very, very bad move. And now rook e4 is played. Hans, Hans takes. And again, I think this is a relay error, by the way, you guys. Uh, bishop to e5 was not played here. Uh, Hans's opponent took, but basically the relay has this position, but the way the game actually went was queen takes e4, uh, bishop to f1, and I think here it was bishop to e5. Um, so this was the position, and then Hans went rook to c4, queen to f5, and after knight takes e5, um, Oberoi resigned here in lieu of the fact that after queen takes e5, white just goes queen d4, forces the queens off the board, and white has an extra rook for a knight, and he additionally has a bunch of pawns on the queen side, which are just going down the board, and um, and so that's why uh, Oberoi resigned. So uh, rather shaky game by Levy. He gets he gets the he gets the win. Um, he gets the win, or not Levy, sorry, a uh, rather shaky game by Hans, but he gets the win anyway, um, and he, he he takes care of business. So let's move on to the next game. Uh, also, someone in chat writes, um, someone in chat says, classical doesn't look boring when it's not Super Jams playing. People still blunder in classical games. Super Jams, just another level. Well, that's kind of the, that's kind of the point that I was making when I talked about the, um, when I talked about the uh, fighting chess indexes. All you have, all that's proven by all those different things is that Super Grandmaster at 2,700 plus are just much better at the game than players who are like 2,500 and 2,600. That's that's just the the reality. Um, so let's let's move on to the next game. Okay, so next game, actually, this is the Andrew game. That'll be the last one. Let's look at the game between Atanasov Anthony and Gregory Kaidana first. Um, now, many people are probably wondering why am I going over this game, but Anthony Antonasov is a, a fan of the stream. I believe his username is AAL123. He's from Canada. He's played in a lot of our viewer arenas, um, so a lot of people know of him, so that's why I'm going to go over this game as well. Um, so he plays D4, D5, um, Bishop F4, C5, E3. Knight to c6, um, knight f3, knight f6, knight d2. Pretty standard e6, c3. Of course, playing against Gregory Kaidanov, who's a, a very strong player, a former United States chess champion, someone that I played against many times when I was younger. So very formidable opponent. So takes, e d4, knight h5, bishop e5. Chat, we made it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, bishop g3, g6, bishop d3. All pretty standard. I'm not going to spend too much time um, going over uh, over the basics here. So trade, castles, castles, rookie one. Um, pretty good position so far out of the opening for white. This is uh, this is an opening I'm used to seeing. Yeah, we've seen a lot of London openings in recent times. Um, so bishop d7. Black wants to basically develop the bishop, bring the rook to the center at some point, play like e5, e4, or f5, f4, maybe even knight f, knight, knight f4 at some point. So bishop b5. Is Anthony title? I believe he is an, I believe he's a feed a master, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I think I think he's a fide master. Um, so bishop b5, rook a8, knight f1 played here by Atanasov, a6 played by Kaidanov, white goes or Anthony goes bishop a4, king to h8, knight to e3, rotating the knight to e3. So now if black plays e5, you can always trade and win the pawn on d5. So it prevents um, prevents pawn to e5. He's an IM. Oh, I thought he was an FM. Last time I saw him playing one of our arenas, he was an FM. But anyway. Um, Anyway, rook d8 is played here. Queen d2 is played by Atanasov. Um, g5 played by Kaidana. Bishop c2. Now, again, one thing that changes a lot is I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. So if you look at, um, or sorry, someone said stop using um, so I'll stop using um. If you look at, uh, or if you look at Grandmaster games and you're trying to figure out how you want to play, in many cases, you have to take chances to create imbalances in a way that you normally would not do. So, for example, 
if Gregory was playing a Grandmaster, I don't think you'd play G5 here because it's very, very aggressive. For that reason, for that reason, in this situation when you're playing a 2100, you decide to go play G5 and go for broke. So at G5, Gregory decides, I'm going to beat this guy's 2100. I have to take some chances. So G5 is played. Bishop C2 played by Atanasov. Kaidana plays bishop to e8, and now g3 is played here to prevent knife to f4. The reason you play knife to the reason you play g3 is first of all, you prevent knife to f4. Additionally, you can play knight to g2 as well and try to double stack and, and gang up on the pawn on e6 here. So knight e7 is played by Kaidanov. Anthony goes king g2, bishop g6. We have a trade. And Anthony plays knight to g4. At this point, it starts, the game starts to go in the wrong, wrong way. For, uh, for Anthony here, I, I would say that the, the main thing is when you get to this position, it's almost like a French defense where black has this very bad bishop on d7 conceptually. It's not really doing much. There's no scope this way towards a4. There's no scope towards g4 because the pawn's in the way. So what, do you, what can you really do with this bishop? So it's a very deep conceptual plan by Gregory here to trade off the bad light square bishop. And now he also has this idea of maybe sacrificing a knife by going to f4. Additionally, he maybe can go f5, f4, and the knight also supports e5. And the last point is now with the rook and queen, you really need to put more pressure on the d5 pawn here if you're going to prevent e5. So knight g4 is played here, rook d to e8. Anthony plays rook a d1. Kaidana plays queen to d7. h3 is played here, rook to e7. So we have a lot of maneuvering. Nothing really special happens. I did not like king h2. I remember watching this live at the time. Um, I think I thought here that white should already be trying to play b3 and c4 and breaking on the queen side or in center. Something like b3, and I, I'm just going to make random moves like king g8, c4, where you try to break and you try to play d5. You have to do something in the center because if you don't do something in the center here, eventually what's going to happen is black's going to play e5 or f4. So king h2 is played. Knight to g7. Queen to d3 played here by Anthony. Gregory plays queen c6, rook d2, knight f5, rook d e2. Okay, so very logical moves to double stack the rooks on e2 and e1, target c6. Black cannot play knight d6 and e4, which is his dream idea, because if you go knight d6, I just take. So Gregory plays king g7, and here Anthony plays knight e3, which is probably, I don't want to say it's the move that loses the game, but it's what messes up uh, any flow and rhythm in the white position here. Because when you play knight e3, you actually give black the dream. Black wants to put in, uh, in a perfect world, I'm just going to make random moves. In a perfect world, black wants to knight on e4, and then he wants to go f5 and f4 and just sauce you on the f file or um, or open up something. You have a lot of weaknesses here because knight on e4 is very, very powerful. Um, there you go. So because of that, you're really giving black the dream here, which is, is not kind of the... The idea you really want to keep the position very very complicated so 93 is is unfortunately the move that really costs anthony the game here i would have probably suggested that he tries again i would suggest that he probably tries to play b3 and c4 he's got to try to open up the center of the board here somehow because when you go 93 96 now now black's getting the knight to e4 f5 f4 is coming and it's very very hard to play so 92 Pawn to f5 played here by Gregory. Again, now you support knight e4. The pawn's on f5 and d5. You also have ideas with f4 and then maybe opening up the f file or jumping with the knife to f4. So knight to f3. Yeah, objectively, the engine says knight to e3 is the best move, but it's to, you have to remember what the engine suggests is best. It's not It's not very human. For example, whoops, I didn't mean to do that, but let's go, let's go here. So you say knight e3 is best, and the computer says knight e3 is best because now you can play the amazing move, knight to g2. Which is not human at all. And after knight e4, you go, you go like c4. Yeah, you go like c4, maybe h. Okay, I mean, this is way too dank. Way too dank. It's just, it's not human. We cannot play like computers. And it, it, if there's no logical flow, it just, it makes no sense. So even though it's objectively the best move, it doesn't, it's just, it's insane. Um, it's very interesting that Super GMs focus on counterplay and engines just hold hold really stupidly. Yeah, well, like I said, 93 is not, if you ask any Grandmaster about 93, would say it's not a good move because so you basically help Black finish his plan. So 92 is played here. Now Gregory goes F5, and the problem here is now White's lost the grip. First of all, with the knight on F3, uh, Black can't push because you, you attack G5. But even if I give, can give you... Um, even if I can give you this position, you still can maybe jump with the pony to e5 here. So when you go knight d2, uh, it's really a step in the wrong direction 
because now after f5, knight f3, knight e4, you basically wasted a tempo and you don't have a way to kick the pony from e4 because your knight's in front of the pawn. If you could move the knight magically and kick the pony, you'd be happy. But you can't do that now. So it gets really bad really, really fast. So knight to e5, they trade. And now, now Gregory plays king h8, kind of a strange move. I, I was very surprised that he didn't just go f4 here because f4 looks very, very powerful. And it's, it's sort of just a very thematic move you take. I take with a rook, f2 is weak. I can, I can line up the double stack and things are going downhill very, very fast. So Gregory goes king h8, which actually gives, gives Anthony one last glimmer of hope to kind of salvage the game here. He can, he can now play c4 again uh, to try and break open the center. Unfortunately, Anthony doesn't do that. He plays knight c2, and he really, after, after g4, it's getting very ugly because now black doesn't even have to play f4. The point is black can rotate the pony to g5 and go for the big forks on f3 with the pawn supporting the knight. So h4 played here, and now Gregory plays f4, just crashing through. And knight d4 played by Anthony, queen e8. Gregory's idea is to go queen h5, double stack, and he's just going to crash on the f-file, and your king is going to get checkmated. So rook takes e4, takes queen e4, rook f7 played by Gregory. Again, perfect, perfect lining up, lines up the double stack on the only open file that's available for the towers. So rook e2 takes, king g3. You could take with the pawn, but after rook f2... King g1, queen f7, black gets the legendary triple stack, and it's going to be game over very shortly. So king takes g3, queen e7 played here, a3, rook f4 played by Gregory, queen takes. Again, not much you can really do here. If you move the queen, I can always just make this check as well. So, so Anthony decides to sack the queen. Queen takes h4, king e3, queen g5, f4. And Gregory goes queen h6, many ways to win here, but the problem ultimately is that black has two pass pawns that are going to rush down the board on the g and h file. So rook g2, queen h3, king g8. Um, I don't know why he went king g8. I would have just gone h5 here because if knight e6, you have the classic fossil with pawn to d g3 check, discovering the knight on e6 here. So h5 is probably slightly more precise, but he goes king g8, which kind of, it, it allows knight e6, um, but Gregory has another idea in hand, which is queen to f3, king to g1, and now g3, threatening checkmate in one on the d1 square, because the pawn holds the two squares for the king escape. And if you go rook to c2, I just check and collect the rook. And if you go rook to d2, I go queen e3 check, and I also collect the rook on d2 or f2. So what can we learn from this game, I guess, is also a big big question mark. And what we can learn from this game is that uh, this is one of the big differences between grandmasters and fide masters and, and even international masters is uh, that they possess an understanding of how to maneuver in a way that slightly lower-rated rate players don't. So like when you look at this game... I, you can't really say that Anthony did anything super wrong, but what Anthony did not understand, and this is also why I do not like playing the London system past a certain rating point, is Anthony didn't understand. He got his general setup. Like I'm sure Anthony is very familiar with the sort of structure, but he didn't really understand the flow of the position. He didn't understand that when you get these kind of this sort of pawn structure, you have to try to play C4 and break in the center of the board. So he started sort of dawdling and just making random maneuvering moves, whereas Gregory, being a five head that he is, uh, he had a clear plan of what he was trying to do with the knights. Like, first he wanted to trade the bishops, get the knights to better squares, and at the right moment, rotate a pony to e4 and play e5 or f5. So you sort of see the difference. Like, Anthony's moves are not bad, but he's just randomly maneuvering all over the board with no conceptual plan. And that's why... That's why uh, that's why he gets in trouble. How come Magnus can play the London here and there then? Well, I don't know. Maybe because Magnus is the world champion, first of all. Secondly, Magnus has played every opening under the sun. He understands all sorts of different pawn structures, and it's not the opening, only opening that he plays. But a lot of players who are like around 21, 2200, they focus on playing one opening. And when you only get certain types of pawn structures and you don't understand what you need to do to open up the position, you can just get outplayed the way that uh, Anthony does here by Gregory. So tough loss for Anthony at, 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 uh, at Tanisov uh, against Gregory Kaidana, but he did play well. I think the main thing, the main takeaway, he's got to understand that when you get these sorts of structures, especially this structure, uh, the f6, e6, d5 versus b2, c3, d4, there are always going to be some issues on the king side. So you always need to be looking to try and open up the, uh, open up the center of the board and get in the c4 push. Very, very critical here. c4 and d5. Um, so that, that's what I would say about this, this game, nonetheless, tough loss, but I think he'll learn, he'll, he'll learn something. And hopefully he watches this video. Cause I think he will learn quite a bit from it as well. Magnus is greater than Anthony. Like, okay.
All right, you guys. So that's those. Those are all the expected results. Now we have one more game we're going to go over, um, which was the big shocker in round one of the Las Vegas Chessville, where Chessville were in typical C nine, in typical Cloud Nine fashion. They take the big, big, big hard L. So D four played by uh, played by Vidyarthi Viom, who's twenty one sixty five. Andrew Tang plays. Uh, or wait, sorry, what was that? Andrew or yeah, Andrew Tang plays uh, plays D five here. Okay, so knight c3 played by Vidyarthi. Knight to f6 played here by Andrew. Okay, pretty standard. We get sort of, um, this is, I think, the, the Jobava London. A little bit different. A um, little bit different than like what we saw in the previous game between Anthony and Gregory, where we had the classical one. So knight's already on c3 here. Uh, so e6, knight b5 played here. Again, I believe that most of the time when I've played this online, like against Hans and Daniel and Jobaba, I've always played Bishop F5. So E6 is, is a little bit dubious. It's not bad, but it's a touch dubious. Because after Knight B5, you have to put your Knight on the rim. As we all know, Knights on the rim are very dim. So E3, uh, no, you guys, black is Andrew Tang, not Andrew Yang. Okay, calm down. So Bishop B4 played here. C3 played by Vidyarthi. Uh, Bishop to E7 played here. He goes Bishop D3. And now here, Andrew Castle's very interesting as I was thinking, I wonder about C6, Knight, A3, if black can actually take and give white the double pawns. If this is good or bad, I guess computer says it's good for white. So probably, um, probably it's not, it's not anything special, but it's the first interesting point. So Castle's is played here. Knight, F3, B6 by Andrew. Um, now the problem with this position again, you guys, is that you have a knight on the rim and you can't really get your knight into the game. Like the knight can't jump because it's blunted by the pawns on C3 and D4. Additionally, after C6, knight A3, even if you go to C7, your knight's still not really in the game. Like you want to play C5, but let me just give you an example. Say you got this position, the way that you put pressure on the, um, on the pawn on d4 is with the knight on c6. So if we go back to the opening, this is why it's very important to note these ideas. Normally, if you play the classic London, bishop f4, just something like this, uh, you'll notice that basically you get a position like this where the knight on c6, it, it puts pressure on d4 long term, but also it helps you play a break, play for a break on e5 at some point. But when you get to this position um, in the game, you'll see that right here, even, even if you get the pawn to c5, your knight is out to lunch. So you go like here, and knight, knight c7, uh, castles in c5, your knight is not putting pressure on anything. The knight is just sitting here, and it's an open target for the bishop on f4. You have no no pressure on d4. You also have no idea, no chance of ever playing e5, because your knight on c7 is just on the wrong square. It needs to be on c6 here. So b6 is played by Andrew, knight e5, bishop b7, castles, c6, knight a3, all pretty normal. Knight c7, queen f3, and we're getting exactly what I told you guys, where Andrew's knight on c7 is bad. Now, if he can maybe rotate it to e4, like he can get knight e8, d6, and knight e4, like for example, let me just make some random moves. You can get some position like this, for example. The knight is very good because you have fork ideas. Also, you can kick the pony with f6 next move. But again, it requires a lot of extra moves. You need one, two, and three, and you hope that white does nothing. So knight d7 played by Andrew here. Uh, I don't like this move at all. I assume I assume you should play knight e8, honestly. Like knight e8, knight e6, you should just go for it. That's what I would do at least. Just try to try to get a pony to e4 at all costs. Because um, after knight d7, queen h3, white is really starting to take it to black here. You've got the right triangle towards h7. Uh, you also have pressure towards d7 and e6. Additionally, the bishop on f4 is targeting the pony on c7 here. So it's very, very dangerous. So f5 played here by Andrew. Avidyarthi plays g4. Another move I like, apparently computer doesn't love it, but I love the spirit. I love the aggressiveness uh, from Vidyarthi here. Very much in the spirit. No fear. I'm going to go all in and try to win the game. So I really lo I lo I love the attitude. So G4 played here. So Andrew plays G6. Vidyarthi trades. Andrew takes. Of course, you can't take with the G pawn because after King H1, uh, your king is getting checkmated here. I have rook g1 coming, knight g6 as well. Your knight is absolutely horrific on e on c7. So really, really bad shape. So take, so Andrew takes. Vidyarthi goes king h1 against going with the theme of trying to put pressure on the g and h files towards the black king, which is kind of alone here on g8. So knight takes e5. Bishop takes e5. Bishop d6 played here by, by Andrew. Now Vidyarthi plays f4. Another great move. Supporting his wooden shield on e5 here. This bishop is really well placed. Additionally, if black takes, you can take this way. Not with the d pawn, because then black can play c5 and d4. And you're going to get scoped on the diagonal from by the uh, by the bishop on b7. So here you would take. And again, even after c5, this bishop is just behind this big pawn. So there's just no scope, no scope for this bishop on b7. 
So f4, so Andrew takes, f takes, queen c8 played by Andrew. Now, again, the only hope you have with black here is somehow get rid of this, this very awful op on, on c8 here with bishop a6. Um, it's really the only idea because, again, even if you get c5, like just a random move, your bishop's going nowhere. There's just a big pawn in front of the bishop. So the way that you want to play is you want to trade off the bishops uh, because this bishop on d3 is really good. It's targeting this whole king side. And if you can get rid of the bishop, it's also one less piece with which white can attack. So because black is, is kind of under a little bit of an attack here, you want to trade the bishops if you can. Actually, I wonder the white, what's wrong with bishop a6 right here? Wait, why didn't Andrew just go bishop a6? Huh? Why didn't he do bishop a6 here? I mean, I guess computer says white is better, but I mean, this is a very poor, poor move by Andrew. Very, very poor move. Uh, I don't like it at all. So he goes queen c8. So Vidyarthi plays rook g1, of course, puts the rook aiming towards the king on g8, bishop a6. And now queen to h6? Why didn't Vidyarthi just go bishop c2 and just continue his plan of double stacking? He goes queen h6, rook f7. Of course, if you take the bishop here, I, I go check. And if you take, I take, whoops, I take, you go king, king g8. Now I go queen h5 check. King can go to either square, but after rook g1 is checkmate because my queen covers a square. Note, if you go queen h6, king g8, rook g1, the king escapes. So, so queen h5 is a nice touch because when you check the king either square, there's, there's no escape to f7 because the, the f7 square and the f6 square are protected. So, okay. So Andrew goes, goes uh, rook f7, logical move. So now if white were to trade, you can block with your rook. So, um, so rook f7, white trades. Now Andrew trades. Um, and Andrew's gotten his dream. So wait, how does Andrew lose this game? Andrew's got the dream. He can bring the queen into d3 or e2. Their checks on e4 and f3. Uh, Andrew can blockade the, the pawn on e5 with the knight on e6. Black should be better here. So he goes rook e2, rook g2, queen d3, good move. Knight c2, knight e6, queen h3. What? Uh, wait, 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 wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Isn't knight f4 just winning the game here? Or am I insane? Oh, you have knight b4 with a trick. Oh, you have a very nasty trick with knight b4, I guess, to save. Wow, this is a very nasty trick to save something here. Still, queen h3, I mean, does not look right at all. I mean, I'm very disappointed that Andrew lost this game because Andrew should be much better if not winning. There's no attack for white. You can play f4. You've got a great knight. Your queen is in. How does Andrew lose this game? Queen f3, rook f8, queen c4. What is rook c8 here? Actually, in fact, what is all what is what is what is rook f8 here? Why not just a5? Take take the square and then go rook f8 and f4 next move. Or even queen e4. Um This is just winning for Andrew. What what is rook f8? Okay, rook c1, rook c8, b3. Okay, queen a5. And knight d3. And I guess I guess the problem here is that you can't really play. You can't really go c5 because the pawn's under pressure. Now I actually have a free hand here to go h4, h5. So now your queen sort of your queen is off sides here. It's completely on the wrong side of the board. And h4, h5 is a big problem. Um, so b5 played by Andrew. Trade. C4. Ooh. Ooh. I don't like that at all. But again, I don't know what else black can do here. Because your your queen is kind of your queen is so off sides here that you have to break it open. So. I mean, maybe there's just nothing better. So queen d1, Andrew goes queen b6. I don't know. Here I would have just traded and tried to salvage this, this middle game. I'm betting Andrew probably thought, you know what? I, I suspect Andrew thought that at this point he had to try to win, so he was going to go over the top rather than, than try to play a slightly worse end game and make a draw. Uh, so he goes here, d5, good move. Now white gets two connected juicers running up the center of the board. Knight c5, e6, good move. Rook e7, knight e5. Nice move by, by Vidyarthi, knight e4, takes, takes, queen d8, rook e8, queen d5, another good move, rook e6, rook b2, okay. So white is much better here, but I'm still kind of impressed that, um, I'm still kind of kind of impressed that Vidyarthi won this, to be honest. Although, actually, this is a huge mistake by Andrew here. He's got to, he's got to, like, trade, and maybe, I guess there's still rook c7, though. There's still rook c7, rook b8. Still very, hmm. 
maybe okay computer says you can trade and go rookie seven and actually this is there are probably pretty good reasonable uh reasonable drawing chances here i would say um that that's what that's that's what i would say is there it seems like they're pretty pretty good pretty good uh pretty good drawing chances. You, you have a you have a bastion on e4 you can probably win this pawn you have three versus two over here so basically as long as you give up this a7 pawn for this d5 pawn and you keep the 3v2 here with the bastion or, or the connect four conversely as well uh it should be a draw so good chances i already went over the levy game earlier we're going to be covering this event when when round three starts in about 24 minutes uh so queen a6 is played Vidyarthi now goes rook b7 threatening the uh, the ladder checkmate here very strong move black's king is now in dire straits on g8 so knight f6 queen d8 knight e8 queen d7 and now you're getting checkmated on f7 and h7 by the castle mania on the seventh rank so you have to go queen c6 but after trade rook a7 your king is cut off and i'm going to be able to line up the ladder again i assume at some point so knight c7 rook b1 nice move and here andrew just resigns because if you take the pawn on c4 i go check king f7 rook b7 and i line up the double stack laterally on the seventh and uh, you lose your pony on c7 and if you play like knight e8 i can just go like rook b8 king f8 i guess i can just even take this one and again your king is paralyzed your knight is stuck and the two rooks are way too powerful here and so andrew resigns this game um he resigns this game here after rook to b1 so very very uh very impressive win by vidyarthi um a very disappointing game from andrew he misses sort of one tactic and it all goes downhill uh in in, in a hurry for him 